Amen. How many love the Lord here tonight? Hallelujah. Amen. Something about that song that just stirs me up, praise God. Never been this homesick before. Hallelujah. I believe it'd be an understatement, understatement of the century to say that I'm homesick for heaven tonight. The more I see in this old world, the more we got going on in the nation, gives me a greater desire to want to go home, praise God. Amen. Part of that chorus says, I'm ready for deliverance. Amen. Wouldn't it just be wonderful for those who are ready if the Lord had just come back? Amen. No more worries, no more crying, no more sickness. Praise God. No more COVID. Wouldn't have to worry about what's going on in the Middle East. Wouldn't have to worry about the wickedness of the nation. Praise God. Amen. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible tells us that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. As some men count slackness, but He's patient and He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. What a God. Hallelujah. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Praise God. Amen. I thank God, amen, that He is merciful. He is long-suffering. One day, friend, that mercy and that long-suffering is going to run out. Amen. Those who are ready is going to be ready. Those who aren't, the Bible tells us where the tree falleth, there shall it lie. Praise God. Amen. The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. God told Noah to build the ark. Amen. The Bible said he was a preacher of righteousness. I heard somebody say one time, well, the Bible doesn't ever say, amen, that uh, Noah tried to get anybody on board. Well, it doesn't directly say that. But have you, you ever known any preacher of righteousness that kept their mouth shut? No. You know they were warning about the wrath of God to come. He was warning about them. But friend, the Bible says when he obeyed God, he built the ark, the animals, and his family, and so on. When he got on, the Bible says that God shut the door. Amen. Friend, there's going to come a day God shuts the door. And when that door shut, friend, it shut. And that rain started falling. I believe when they felt the first drop of rain, they realized it was too late. Praise God. Amen. They wasn't no life jackets floating around in case he wanted to get on board after the flood. They wasn't no second boat came floating around. When that door was shut, friend, it was shut. Amen. I don't want to miss the door. What is that door? Jesus said, I am the door. Praise God. Hallelujah. I don't want that door to be shut on me to you. Amen. I say, God, let me walk on through it. Hallelujah. Amen. If you got your Bibles tonight, turn with me, if you will, to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 11. I'd like to say it is an honor for me and my family to be back with you here at North Clayton. Amen. We do appreciate the work, amen, and the word that goes forth here. Uh, see some familiar faces, some I've never seen before, amen, but thank God for it. Amen. I hope you're striving as we all are striving, amen, to enter in, praise God. Enter in the straight gate, hallelujah. I'd like to thank Pastor Reed for inviting us to come back and minister in word and song. Amen. Something that we don't take lightly, the work of God, hallelujah. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter number 11. But before we read the word tonight, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to help and anoint us. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. Lord, we magnify your name in this house here tonight. And Lord, I know that this word that we're about to read is already anointed. But God, one more time, would you anoint me to deliver, anoint our ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church, Lord. Lead us, guide us, direct us. Lord, if they be one here lost and undone, or backslid in their heart, I pray they won't lead the same way as they entered in. God has direct us in all truth. In Jesus' name, the church said, Amen. amen. 2 Samuel chapter 11, if you're able, let's stand for the reading of God's Word tonight. 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning with verse number 1. The Scripture says, And it came to pass, after the years was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbath. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. 
And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. She came unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Amen. You may be seated tonight if you'd like. The Holy Ghost would help and direct me for just a little while this evening. I want to preach on this thought, the cost of slackness. The cost of slackness. We're familiar tonight with King David, probably one of the most well-known characters, if you will, in the Old Testament, one of the most well-known men in the Bible. Amen. And what a story about King David that we read. David was a man of war. He was a warrior and he was a fighter. The Bible declares him to be a man right after God's own heart. What a testimony that would be for us tonight that if we was to, if time was to tarry and the Lord was to tarry his coming and we would be laid in the grave that we would have a testimony that we were a man or a woman right after God's own heart. That God's heart was in us and we follow after his plan, praise God. Amen. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our children came up, amen, our neighbors came up and said they was somebody that was after the heart of God. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to chase after his heart tonight, don't you? I want to know his heart, hallelujah. And I don't only want to know it, but I want it to know me, praise God. I want the heart of God to be a mirror in my life. And I don't want to conform God to me, but I want to conform to God's heart, hallelujah. We, you know, and I know I'm taking a side street this evening, but we got a lot of people tonight that's got the potter and the clay turned around, you know what I'm saying? Amen. We act like we're the potter and God's the clay and we're going to mold and shape God to fit our image. But friend, it don't work that way. If you're going to have anything with God, you've got to be the clay. He's got to be the potter and he's got to mold us to work the things out of us that doesn't belong. Hallelujah. But the Bible declares that David was a man that was after God's own heart from the time he was tending sheep in his dad's pasture until this point right here. David was a fighter, amen. He was made an overcomer by the help of the Lord. He was anointed king of Israel, amen. He just didn't stumble upon it. But friend, the Bible said that he was anointed after Saul fell. He was anointed to be king and to rule over Israel, amen. Friend, it's a special thing to be anointed of the Lord, hallelujah. I'm afraid that too many people People tonight across the land, amen, treat the anointing of God so casually. They treat it so cheap, amen, like it's just something, amen, that's there, amen, and praise God. And I believe tonight that we can have as much of God and His anointing and the Holy Ghost as we want to have, praise God. But we got to remember it comes from above, hallelujah. It ain't something that we drum up. It ain't something that we wish up or pump up, amen, but it comes from the Lord. Hallelujah. And friend, I want you to know, you'll know, you'll know when a man or a woman of God is anointed by Him. They won't have to broadcast it. They won't have to have the titles. They won't have to have the smoke, the fog, or the mirrors. Friend, you'll know when an anointed person's walked through the door. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The anointing of God's going to bear witness. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible said that he was anointed. Amen. King over Israel. However, we read here in verse number 1. Amen. In verse number 1, it says that it came to pass after the year was expired at the time Time when kings go forth to battle. Amen. This was a time of war. This was a time right here it said where the kings go forth up to battle. Amen. You would have thought David seeing the victory that he saw. Seeing the uh, giant slayed. Amen. And the bear and the lion slayed and all the enemies of Israel slayed. You would have thought David would have been the first one to have jumped up, grabbed the sword 
sword, grabbed the shield or the spear or whatever else he may have had, his helmet, his body armor, and say, boys, let's go down to the battlefield. This is the time where the kings go forth to war. Amen. Let's get on it. Hallelujah. But the Bible tells us a very different statement. Amen. It says when it came time, amen, for kings to go to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbith. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. When Joab and all the mighty men of Israel was risking their life, going forth to slay the enemy, the Bible said David, amen, tarried back at Jerusalem. Amen, friend, I want you to know tonight if David would have had that day to do over again if he would have had that decision to relive I could about guarantee you friend he would have went to battle he would have went down there and fought but the Bible said that he made the decision amen to stay back at Jerusalem and we read here in verse number 2 and it came to pass in the evening time that David arose from off of his bed amen he wasn't fighting he was laying in the bed. Amen, friend. I don't know about you, but it bothers me. Amen. That here there are all these men and amen. These people or these warriors are fighting, risking their lives. And the Bible said David stayed behind on his bed. Amen, friend. That was a mistake. It was a wrong decision. The Bible said at evening time that he walked upon his roof. He begins to look around Jerusalem. Like any king would. Look around the area that he's at. Look around the area where he reigns. He begins to look at a certain housetop. He sees a woman there by the name of Bathsheba. And Bathsheba wasn't there just looking around the city. The Bible said that she is on the rooftop. Amen. Bathing herself at that time. I don't know why they bathed on the rooftop. I couldn't even imagine that. Amen. Nowadays, amen. I, I, that's just beyond my comprehension. I've not studied the history as to why they even done that to begin with. Amen. But they said that, amen, David looked across at the roof and saw this woman washing herself and saw the Bible said that she was very beautiful to look upon, amen when David stayed behind that day, amen, when he tarried behind at Jerusalem he saw this lady amen, bathing herself and he began to lust amen, after this woman Bathsheba now wait a minute brother Chris I thought you said David was a man after God's own heart and he was, wait a minute it, brother I thought you said he was anointed of God and yes he was but friend I want you to know just because you're anointed just because you're called out just because amen you're after God's heart don't think for one moment that the enemy is not going to come by your way and send a temptation to try and bring you down friend when you got saved you were saved from sin but don't think for a moment temptation won't ever come not in your way friend I'm here to tell you tonight the devil knows I said he knows what to tempt us with Amen. You see, you hear what I'm saying tonight? Amen. He knows just what to throw our way. He's not going to tempt you with things, amen, that don't, you don't even t pay any attention to. Amen. There's some people that's never battled drug addiction, and the devil knows that. So he's going to try something that they did battle. Hallelujah. Or those ones that has battled addiction. Don't think for one moment that the devil ain't going to put a billboard, an advertisement, an old buddy to come by. They're trying to drag them down hallelujah amen friend the devil would like nothing more than every man woman boy and girl in this place tonight amen to fall flat on their face to back up from what God's given them and to find themselves in a place of slackness friend I'm here to tell you tonight amen the word of God teaches you and I amen that God has made a way of escape for you and I praise God God. He said you will not 
you will not be tempted more than what you can bear. Well, Brother Chris, the devil sure is tempting me. Friend, that's a reason to shout right there. Because my God promised me that if I'm tempted by it, I can overcome it. Hallelujah. But how many is overcoming tonight? How many is getting past the temptation? Amen. How many is getting past the slackness? David looked out across that rooftop. He began to look after this woman that was babe and began to lust after her. And he commanded, amen, his messengers to go to her rooftop and to bring her to him. Amen. And when they brought her to him, the Bible said that they committed adultery. Amen. And the story goes on to say that they conceived the child out of wedlock. Amen. And the list goes on and on the events that happened. And I want you to get this right here. It was all because of one day David stayed behind and he stayed away from the battlefield. He would have never went to that rooftop. He would have never looked at that woman. And he would have never committed adultery that night had he went to the battle like he was supposed to on that day. My Lord, I feel a burden to preach this here tonight. Amen. David knew what the price was going to be. Amen. And what was that price he was paying? He was paying for the slackness for staying behind. Because one day, one evening, David slacked up from his battle just a little while that he ended up falling to Bathsheba. Amen. The church world today, listen to me, the church world today has become slack. You hear me tonight? Amen. When we are born again, we are enlisted in the army of the Lord. We as Christians have to stay on the battlefield in this Christian walk. Friend, when I got saved, it wasn't a one-time event. Amen. It's been an everyday walk. Hallelujah. The apostles Apostle Paul made the statement. He said, I die daily. Hallelujah. It's a daily walk, friend. John the Baptist said, I must decrease so he can increase. Hallelujah. I got to get to the place where every day I find myself on the battlefield for the Lord. We sang that song out of the red back hymnal. I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. I promised him that I would serve him until I die. Die. But friend, are we really on the battlefield tonight? I want to ask you that question. Are we really on that battlefield? Are we really fighting the good fight of faith? Are we really giving it everything we got? Or has there been slackness somewhere creeping in? My Lord in heaven tonight, I feel this going through my through my heart this evening. We have, as Christians, we have to stay on the battlefield in this walk. There is no time, listen to me, there is no time for slackness in this fight. There is no time, amen, for slackness in our walk with God. Amen. However, instead of many contending and fighting for this faith, we find ourselves getting lazier so to speak and less concern than we ever have before just as slackness did for David slackness in a life or in a church will lead to sin and it will lead to a backslidden condition you hear me I know we don't like to talk about being backslidden and I know we don't like to talk about things like this but I've learned from experience over the past 13 years you get in a slack condition you get in a place where you get slack with your walk with God amen friend you'll find yourself in a backslidden condition I looked up that word slack and it means a spell of inactivity or laziness it means to loosen you know you're tying a tow rope Somebody on the other side, you got this big load in a truck bed and you're, you throw that tow rope over the truck bed and hope you didn't knock them out. And they say, okay, I got it. And you're trying to, trying to tighten it down and they'll say, give me some slack to try and get it around there. Slack means to loosen. And this is the one that stirred my heart the most. It means to decrease or reduce in intensity, quantity, 
or speed. I'm preaching to you tonight on the cost of slackness. David made a conscious decision that day not to go on the battlefield, amen, when he was supposed to go and fight with the army of God, amen. But because he was slack one time, his world was completely turned upside down, amen. Friend, I want you to know from this day forward, yes, David retained a relationship with God. Yes, he paid repentance, amen. He uh, repented, amen, but he also he paid a price amen you read from this chapter on it seems like there was nothing but turmoil amen for the decisions that David made in his life what did Paul write in Galatians he said be not deceived God is not mocked for whatever whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap amen David began to sow to the flesh and from this point on he reaped destruction because one day he got slack on God my Lord in heaven here tonight amen how much slackness has engulfed the church world today I don't know about you but it concerns me I mean it really concerns me when I look around and I see the unconcerned amen I see people not pushing like they used to push I see the reduce in intensity the reduce in quantity and the reduce in their speed of doing things for God. Amen. It bothers me church. Amen. To see people who used to run and fight the good fight. Now they're kind of just lagging back. Amen. Floating in and floating out. Be thankful I even showed up. No. We got to fight this thing. The Bible says to strive to enter in. Amen. Striving is not just amen skipping along. It's not just waltzing down the road. Amen. The strive means to push. The straw means to fight. It means to put everything into it to enter in the straight gate. Hallelujah. I got to strive to enter in. Friend, I'm not going to enter in on slackness. You hear me? Amen, friend. We are not in a day and an hour. We cannot afford slackness tonight. Amen. And I, I, I found it interesting. Amen. That when I looked up this word slack, it put it this way a spell of inactivity and laziness. Amen. And I, I shared with my wife before church. I said, you know, you, you see this condition creep into so many churches. And don't sit there and say, Brother Chris, it'll never happen to me. Friend, I want you to know you'll find yourself slack on God before you even think. Amen. It don't take long, amen, to get at ease in Zion. Amen. No, I don't believe you backslide overnight, but it don't take a three-year process either. Come on, somebody. Amen. You'll be there before you even know it. Amen. But it said a spell of inactivity. I've told my wife, I said it feels like some people just fall into a trance. They just fall into this slump. Amen. Where they don't care if they go to church. They don't care if they pray. They don't care if they see revival. They just don't don't care. Friend, it's a horrible place to find yourself in with a I don't care attitude. We got a generation that's ate up with I don't care. Amen. Let it happen. It don't matter. I don't care. And it bothers me, not only as a minister, but as a Christian. And it should bother us that there's so many folks, amen, they treat the house of God. They treat the things of God. Amen, friend, I could ask each and every one of us, you may be sitting here lost as a duck in high weeds, but I guarantee you, you can say, Brother Chris, God's still been good to me. He still showed mercy. He still showed grace. He showed favor. He's blessed when I didn't deserve it. He's helped me along life's way. But friends, so many times when it comes time to our part, amen, we have this don't care attitude, this nonchalant, amen, like nothing in the world is really going on. Friend, I want you to know it is an honor for me to get to go to my father's house on a Sunday night. It's an honor for me to get to preach my father's word. It's an honor 
honor for me to gather in here with brothers and sisters in Christ and worship God in the beauty of holiness. It's not a light thing. It's not just something I do like I do going to Walmart. But friend, it's a high calling. It's a thing. It is a pearl of pure price. Hallelujah. A pearl of great price. Amen, friend. Amen. I'm to preaching tonight on the cost of slackness. Amen. There's so much going on in the world tonight, and it bothers me. There is no time, and I repeat, there is no time for slackness in the house of God. Amen. Have you ever been to the place yourself, or have you ever been around somebody? They could not wait to go to the house of God on Sunday morning. And when the Sunday morning service was over, they couldn't wait to get back on Sunday night. And Sunday night was over, they couldn't wait for midweek. You remember the day when we used to be in church all the time? Come on now. You remember the day where we were always trying to figure out who was having revival? Amen. When there's a revival going on, you remember that? You remember the prayer meetings? Yeah. How many here remembers house prayer services, tent revivals, brush arbors? Friend, we was in service all the time. We couldn't wait. It, it wasn't a burden. It didn't get boring. We longed for it. Amen. When we've been in a week or two of revival, always the Monday after it ends, we're sitting at home. What do we do? Hey Amen, this feels weird. Well, you know, we should be in church. We should be saying. We should be preaching now. We should be in. The, we're like, we're lost. And that's a desire for the things of God. But when you get to the place where it becomes a burden and you don't really care if you end up missing midweek, come on now. You don't really care if you don't make it for Sunday school. Hey Amen, I know this ain't popular. Hey Amen, it's bouncing all around in here. You don't care if you make it. Back to church on Sunday night. You don't care if you only make it to one night of revival and your church is going a week, week and a half. It don't bother you no more. It don't bother you that you don't go to the altar and pray. God, I feel God in this. Amen. Just as much as I'm standing here. It don't bother you that your prayer closet has become cluttered. It don't bother you that there's dust on the altar at the spot where you used to pray. It doesn't bother you that you went days now without even picking up your Bible. Amen. Before you know it, you went through a day and you didn't even read. You didn't even talk to God. And it's almost like, oh well, God understands I'm busy. My, 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 my. Amen. Slackness costs David everything. You listen to me tonight. Look at the slackness. And I use the example of the church world. And I'll even use the example of my life. Brother Chris could pray more. I could fast a lot more. You could look at me and tell that. I could do a lot more pushing back the plate. Amen. I could probably be in a few more services here and there if I was to really push. Amen. But friend, I'm here to tell you there's nothing good. Amen. That will ever come out of slackness. Hallelujah. Friend, I'm here to tell you we are living in a day where we need to take the words of the Apostle Paul where he said, I press toward the mark. I'm pressing with everything in front of me. Amen. I'm forgetting the things that are behind and I'm looking forward. Amen. Friend, I'm not looking to the left or right. I'm not looking at everybody else, but I'm centered in on myself and I'm pressing on. Hallelujah. Amen. Three things, and I'm going to leave you with this, and I'm going to be dumb. Three things slackness costs David that is also costing the church today. Number one was the life of Uriah and people's souls on that battle. Verse number 15 of chapter 11 here. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die my Lord in heaven verse number 21 who smoke Abilamech the son of Jerubashab if I pronounce that correctly did not a woman cast the pieces of a millstone upon him from the wall 
that he died in Tabez, why went ye nigh the wall? Then said thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David's slackness on that day resulted in him in committing sin in an attempt to protect his image. He ordered that Uriah be put on the front line of the battlefield knowing more than likely that he would be killed. Notice that not only Uriah but others lost their life in battle because David was trying to hide the sin that was result of slackness on that day. Friend, I want you to know when I begin to read that, the thought came to my mind, we have lost people in the house of God today due to their own slackness. Amen. We've lost some due to our slackness. God help me this evening. When folks get slack and they're complacent in their walk of God, they begin to die spiritually. A lot of times we don't even care when someone in the church dies spiritually because we are slack ourselves. You think about those for a minute that has fell out of church. You think of those who was faithful but now you can't hardly even get them in the door because of slackness. It bothers me, amen, that we have lost so many because of slackness that has crept in. You hear me tonight? I'm trying to help us. I'm trying to encourage us tonight. Amen. So many has fallen because they came slack with their walk with God. I remember just this past Sunday night, We've had a young man that's been coming to our, our excuse me, to our church. Just got out of prison. Had been in prison, I want to say, eleven years, something like that. I met him when I first started evangelizing down in Georgia, and he just got out back in May. And he was coming for a while, seemed to be doing good. His name was Jay. And then all of a sudden, Jay got a girlfriend. And Jay got more interested in that. He ended up going and moving in and now it's been several weeks since he's been in the house of God. And this past Sunday night, my, my kids loved him. Especially my daughter loved him. I always was excited to see him. He'd be sitting in the back and they'd call his name and they'd run back to him. This past Sunday night at church, my daughter was laying in my, or sitting in my wife's lap and all of a sudden she just loses it. Loses it like she got bit or got hit or got cut. I mean, just loses it. And all of a sudden, she starts saying his name. Jay. Jay. And she starts crying. She said, I miss Jay. Where is he? Where is he? Why ain't he here? He needs to be here. And I mean, just, I mean, she's only known this man four months in church. And she loses it. And when I saw that, Brother Marvin, I said, you know, I said, have I shed any tears about him not being here? Have I cried about him backing out the door? Have I cried about him going back to a lifestyle of sin? Has it bothered me even at all? Amen. To even get a little teary-eyed. She's losing it. She's bawling and squalling. But do we as a church even care when the enemy comes in and drags one of our own out the door? Do we even blink an eye or do we even notice? the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Do we even notice? Do we say things like, well, I knew it would happen. I saw it coming. Yeah, through the eyes of the Spirit, you may have seen it coming, but it should bother you and I. We shouldn't be so slack to the point in our walk of God that it's costing us men and women, and it's like it doesn't even bother us. Friend, when anybody, and I mean anybody, falls out, 
We should have a burden, amen. We should be praying them back in. We should be like that prodigal son's father, amen, standing on the porch expecting at any moment for them to walk in. I've been in places that seem, I've been in churches that seem like Brother Marvin. They've just lost all vision. They've just lost all hope. And I'll tell them, I said, have we forgotten the fact that at any moment those back doors could open, a sinner, a backslider could walk in, and they're relying on me and you to give them some hope to give them something that the world can't give them have we forgot about that friend I believe that we need to be standing on the porch waiting at any moment looking way down the road amen for that person to be coming back in friend I'm telling you my wife told my daughter she said when you think of him that way you begin to pray for him and she said you know I think she's four years old folks four years old she said I think we're going to pray for him too when we get back home. I said, well, that's a good idea. We'll do that too. Hallelujah. Amen, friend. We need to be standing on the porch waiting for them to come. Amen. And some of us need to be bold enough like the one with the lost sheep to lead the 99 to go down there in the highways and hedges where they're at and say, what's going on? And compel them to come back in. Hallelujah. Friend, have we become so slack that it's just a number? Have we become so slack that it's costing us people? I've even made the statement, and I shouldn't make this statement. I shouldn't have to make this statement, but I'm as guilty as anybody else, I guess. I've made the statement, has anybody even reached out to them? Has anybody even tried to contact? Has anybody even made an effort to see why they've not been here? God help us. Because of David's slackness that resulted in his sin, he had this innocent man murdered. And not only him, but it affected, uh, uh, no telling how many warriors that day lost their life because of David's slackness. You listen to me tonight. You may say, oh, Brother Chris, I can take my ease. I can eat, drink, be merry, kick back, do my own thing. If I make it to church, great. If I don't, if I pray to Today, great if I don't oh well amen God knows friend you see that's what the issue is God really knows we may pull the wool over our spouse's eye our pastor's eye the Christian's eye but we never pull the wool over God's eyes we can't afford to get slack I've seen men and women that pressed on even when they wasn't physically able to amen they pressed on they didn't get slack they didn't get complacent. They had every reason to stay home. They had every reason to say, I'm not able to do it. But they pressed on. And friend, they were some of the greatest influence in my life. Amen. Just a, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to a pastor down in a, a South Georgia, close down there to the Florida line. Pastor's a, a hole in his church. He's distance akin to my wife. And when we went down there, Brother Marvin, there was a gentleman there he was an old school church of God a prophecy pastor and uh, he had, had suffered a stroke and it paralyzed him on one side and he was always in a wheelchair he couldn't walk anymore couldn't move uh, uh, those limbs anymore on that particular side but friend I want you to know as long as that man was alive he was more faithful to the house of God than some of us young folks are and I remember being in services down there the whole Holy Ghost should begin to take over and he wasn't able to run because he was in the wheelchair but he would get that wheelchair and he would push those wheels real fast and when he pushed those wheels he would raise his hand he would do that up and down the aisle amen that was his running that was his getting in and I thought my Lord in heaven how slack have we become because we got a little headache or because we had a hard week at work come on now or because things are going right wrong at the house we come in we act like we're orphans like we lost our best friend but friend we cannot afford to get slack on worshiping God amen we can't afford to get slack on anything that pertains to God moving on amen this evening I'm trying to hurry I've just got such a burden to preach this number two victory was lost because 
of slackness. As a result of David's sin, Uriah and others were pushed to battle and victory was lost on that day. Do you not believe tonight that we're going to be pushed to battle? We're going to be faced with battles that we wasn't expecting. We're going to have to lace up our boots and put on our uniform when we don't feel like it sometimes, you hear me? Amen. When we don't feel like fighting, we're going to have to fight. Amen. Oh, God, help us here tonight. Amen. But because of David's sin, they were pushed into this battle. And victory was lost on that day all due to slackness. Do you know in today's modern church world that many are losing battles to Satan week after week? This may not be helping you, but this has turned my heart. Amen. We are losing battles. Well, you remember the church of yesterday, not that long ago. Some of you elders can attest to this. Back in old Pentecost, the church of 30 years ago, 40 years ago, Friend, when they came to the house of God, they meant business. They wasn't hints of slackness, though there's always been slackness. The church was pushing. The church was striving. The church had that Apostle Paul mentality for getting what's behind. We can't do nothing about it anyway. Just press, hallelujah. Just press on, hallelujah. Friend, when people would come to the house of God, sinners would be under so much conviction, they would shake on the pew. You've heard the statement, nail marks on the pew. Amen. Now, now we snarl at that. We wrinkle our nose at that. Well, no, you know, we don't really need that necessarily. Friend, when the conviction power of God fell... One or two things happened. They either ran to the altar or they ran out the door. Amen. They didn't play around with God. They weren't appointed to positions. Come on, somebody. I know we don't like to talk about that. Amen. They weren't put over the Sunday school or anything like that. But there was conviction and they either ran or they responded to it. And when they responded to it, that was a victory that was won. People that were sick would walk through the door. I'm talking about cancer. I'm talking about bad stuff. Injuries. They'd lay hands on them. They'd be healed. Physical healing. You talk about physical healing nowadays and even a lot of our Pentecostal church your road off is charismatic your road off is one of them new age ones friend I'm here to tell you today it's it still happened the God of that Bible I was reading and I shared with my wife the other day I said you know that passage where Jesus said when he sent the disciples out and he said take neither script nor extra coat or anything like that and dust the shoes off if they don't receive you and if they do receive you go in and eat I said in those passages he tells them in every gospel he said go heal the sick. Lay hands on them and heal the sick. It's part of it. Amen. These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. People were filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And they knew what they had. Hallelujah. But friend, have you noticed now in our, and I'm trying to be nice, our laid back generation, calling it like it is, our complacent generation our satisfied generation that not many battles are being won come on now people walk in sinners and it seems like nine times out of ten they walk out sinners they come in sick I'm preaching in a mirror too I gotta do some things on this too they come in sick and they walk out sick Amen. We used to be praying tumors off of people and now we're doing good to pray over a migraine headache. Amen. Come on now. Amen. You're seeing less and less and less people baptized with the Holy Ghost. Hey man, we got a lot of organizations that even less than 50% of their members have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Don't tell me we're not losing some battles. Don't tell me we're not losing some fights. And a lot of it, friend, and owe me as well and amen, a lot of it is due to slackness. Amen. 
when we used to raise up early to see the face of God when the men and women of God would get on their face and say God not my will but thy will be done when ministers got in the prayer closet and saw God what to preach instead of trying to find Hey, come on now. Amen, friend. And I thank God you and I have seen what we do have. We've seen drug addicts saved. Yeah. Amen. We've seen people born again. We've seen healings. I thank God. God has blessed us, Brother Reed. We've seen miracles after miracles in the last few years. Seen blinded physically. Blinded eyes opened right down here in Stevens County back in 2015. Seen my own grandmother Left for dead, hospice called in, prayed over. God made a miracle right then. Hospice came back in, canceled. They said, our service ain't needed here. She don't need no hospice. Come on now. But we should be seeing it widespread. We should be expecting every time we come through the house of God, through the door into the house of God. This isn't just any regular Sunday night service. This could be the day somebody surrenders to God. This could be the day I finally get peace of mind. This could be the day I finally get my miracle. Amen. When we came to the house of God years ago, we expected something to happen. I wonder who's going to get saved. I wonder who's going to get blessed I wonder who's going to shout and my Lord it might just be me it just might be my night hallelujah amen we should be expecting every time I don't care if it's Wednesday night and the seven regulars come in that's dead dog tired from work we should be expecting something to happen hallelujah we shouldn't become so slack amen to the point where we ain't expecting God to move anymore Friend, when we begin to mean business with God and we begin to really fight again, we will see some victory in the house of God. Friend, I want you to know there's going to be some things you and I have to pray about. Amen. That it's going to take more than a lay me down to sleep prayer to get it done. My little kids, it's got a book. And it's got a, a, a picture of a moon on it. It's this little prayer and it says... I see the moon and the moon sees me. God bless the moon and God bless me. And I read that, Brother Marvin, and I said, you know, that's about the prayer life of a lot of people. You know, God bless the earth and God bless me and that's going to be it. Hallelujah. Sometimes we're going to have to battle. How are we going to battle, Brother Chris? We're going to battle on the altar. We're going to battle in the prayer closet. We're going to battle. We're going to fight. Amen. To try and get a hold of God. Amen. I like what I heard B.H. Clinton and say. I was listening to a message a couple of weeks ago. And he said most of our praying isn't enough to move heaven or shake hell. And I thought, yeah, that's today's generation and it ever has been. Amen. But I would like today. Amen. You know why the devil fights us so much on prayer? It's because he knows he'll never stop a praying church. But if he can get us slack in that... He knows he has us beat. Amen. He'll never stop a praying church. He'll never stop a praying people. Hallelujah. And lastly tonight. Amen. Probably one of the most heartbreaking of the three. The slackness and sin of David costed him the son of adultery. The son of adultery. His son. Or in other words, the next generation. This breaks my heart. I have no doubt after David's slackness and sin that he thought, I will have Uriah killed. I'll marry Bathsheba. And everything, including the child born in adultery, will be all right. I will keep living life as normal. And nothing will happen. Uriah is killed. David and Bathsheba married, and the boy was born. Lord, help us here. One day, however, here comes Nathan the prophet. Can I tell you, friend, God's always going to send somebody. It don't matter how well we think we got it hid. It don't matter how well we think that, you know, we're okay. I'm under grace. God's got me, and... And the list just goes on and on. God's going to send a prophet by. Yeah. Amen. Nathan comes by and Nathan 
sits down with David. He begins to share what the Lord tells him and laid on his heart. He tells David about a rich man. This is just a breakdown of it. A rich man and a poor man that was in the city. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds. The poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb. Nathan tells David that this lamb was special to the poor man and his family. He nourished it and brought it up. It grew up together with his children to the point it felt like his own daughter. Have you ever seen people attached to their pets? This was a man that was. The poor man let it eat and drank what he was eating. The ewe lamb was more than a pet to this poor man. It was like a child. One day a traveler came to visit the rich man and instead of using one of his many lambs to feed the visitor, he commanded and got the poor man's lamb, killed it and cooked it for the traveler. Instead of making the effort, talk about slackness, instead of making the effort to get one of his lambs, have it slayed, he went and he said, go get that poor man's lamb and kill it. Feed it to my visitor. When David heard this story, the Bible said that his anger was greatly kindled against the man. No doubt David jumped up. I, just in my mind, I could picture if he was at a table or at a chair, him jumping up and dishes going everywhere. And he said, as the Lord liveth, the man that done this shall surely die. And Nathan looked at David and he said, thou art the man. Could you imagine that? sinking feeling that engulfed David. I believe they didn't have to be one more thing said after Nathan said thou art the man. I believe he knew what it was, how it happened, and what was going to happen. Nathan tells David that the Lord has put away his sin. We can find forgiveness but because this deed has given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the name of God, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Do not tell me your decisions, your sin, and even your slackness only affects you because it don't. It affects so many others. It affects your family. It affects your children. It affects those that are around you and because of David's slackness it cost him this son church I'm sad to report tonight we are losing an entire generation because of sin and slackness if they see you and I slacking up they see you and I missing church you and I not really living the word of God they begin to die spiritually and fade away. It bothers me, and I thank God there's still a few. Listen, if God was done with the church, we wouldn't be here. I want you to listen to me. If God was done with the work, He would have already said, come up hither. There's still a hope. But I'm so tired, and it bothers me. We watch children in so many churches. I've been evangelizing now for 13 years, and I can't tell you... How many times I've seen this. So many of them, they grow up, they hit the teenage years, they hit adulthood, and they're gone. And some of them I've not seen in a very long time. Because of slackness, it is costing an entire generation. I've heard the elders testify about when they were growing up, they'd hear mom and dad praying in the bedroom. I remember right over here in Hayesville hearing testimonies about different men and women having prayer altars in the woods. And they would go in them woods and they said that they could hear the echo from the community. They would hear the echo and it would bring conviction. Just hearing their voice echo in prayer. It brought conviction because many of those men and women was calling some of them men's names out to God and it brought conviction. I've heard stories about how years ago on Unicoi Mountain between Hiawassee and Helen that you could go through there real slow and you could hear people praying off of the mountains. But I want to ask you 
if the Lord tarries another generation and these children grow up to my age, 30, early 40s, they get our age, are they going to have the testimony? I heard mom and dad in the back bedroom praying. I, I remember tarrying in the altar. I remember hearing somebody out in the woods praying. I remember revivals going and going and going and all this. Are they going to even have a testimony if time tarries because of slackness? Well, I've, uh, me and Brother Jonathan Airwood's done a lot of preaching over the years. And I remember several years ago when we first started preaching, we started about the same time we had youth revivals. I think Sister Dot may have went to a couple of them had people growing up, had all kinds of denominations. I mean, they were young people from everywhere. It bothered me one time, Brother Reed. I mean, we got in there and we had church. You get a bunch of young people on fire for God. and Man, you can't hardly keep them down. Amen. They're all over the place. They're shouting. They're falling out. They're getting filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, it's just wow. That's why it's important to have a youth group on fire for God. They'll make your church. They will make a church. And there's people that was born and raised in Pentecost, born and raised around those who proclaimed the Spirit of God, went to him and he said, we have never even seen anything like this. Never seen messages given out. Never seen prophecy. Never seen anybody slain. Never seen anybody... Never, never seen any of this. You're 17, 18, 19, 20 years old and you've never seen a manifestation of the Spirit of God and we sit in churches that's supposed to believe in this. Friend, that bothers me. That tells me somewhere there's slackness. Friend, if I'm going to wear the title, I need to be a participator. Amen. Amen. Come on now. Friend, I know this is going to go over like a red balloon. You know why we're not called holy rollers anymore? You already got the answer. Amen, friend, because it's just not there. Amen, friend, there's been slackness in the camp. And it is costing us the next generation. This generation is looking for something real. They're looking for something they can't find from the drugs, from the alcohol. They can't find on the shelves of Walmart. They are looking for something real. And when they walk through the door, and if they can't find it here, all hope for them is lost. When they walk in the door, we need to have the testimony. The church of yesterday when people would say, I want what they've got. I want what they have. Amen. Would you stand with me all over the house? I wish the Lord would have let me preach something a little bit different, a little bit softer. But I believe God laid us in this direction to encourage us, to move us. We are living in a slack generation and it's even crept its way in the house of God that push that drive that I've got to go even if I don't feel like it I got to go even if I could be working on the house I got to go even you know even if I've got a dozen things to do I'm not going to do and even start on number one until I get down in prayer that drive that drive and that push it's not so it's only going to help us but it's going to help those around us these altars are open if you need to be anointed and prayed for anything we'll do that but I'm going to invite all who will let's gather in if you need salvation if you need deliverance if this message has pricked your heart and you said brother Chris I have found slackness in my life and I need to get it under control now would you come tonight all who will let's come as a church let's gather in